So good morning, everyone. It is week nine, MED 110, 5DAX, Tuesday morning, December uh, 7th. Uh, final exam will be, of course, on the 14th, and it will be online via Zoom. Now, how's the uh, online format going to go down? Well, at 8.55 a.m. next week, Wednesday, um, and for the person uh, who, um, who asked to take the exam early. Um, if, you, if you take the exam early, it'll be a different exam than everyone else. It'll be similar questions, similar items. It'll be a version of it, but uh, no one understand you can't take the exam late, but you can sure as heck take it early because um, there are students who are trying to, you know, uh, tactically plan out things regarding their financial aid and or, you know, other classes. Um, because I have other students, they have online class on top of it, and their online is due the same day, the same day as this exam, whatnot. But to your discretion, shoot me an email if you want if you want to take it early. But the official exam is at starts at nine a.m. December fourteenth. And how do you do it? You go inside here, announcements. Okay, nowhere else, announcements, and it'll say week ten final exam. And then when you open it up there will be a um, um, uh, Microsoft Word document file. Um, and you just do the one through 50 answers, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And please don't put in parentheses what you mean by your answer. Because at the end of the day, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Just because you have an explanation attached to it. Okay, uh, all well and good. But um, the exam that you're about to take was taken by at least two or three other classes and meaning to say it's been vetted. That means we looked at every single question and there's no ambiguous questions on your exam uh, as far as I know, but maybe you could find one. And if you do kudos to you and then um, you know, you know me, I'm flexible. I, I guess um, I can award you the point if you can uh, give me proper evidence that the, the question is either erroneous or the answer is erroneous. Well, so you go here and you just email me at ngarias at stratford.edu um, uh, by 10, 15 a.m. that day. So you will have one hour and 15 minutes to uh, perform a 50 item multiple choice exam. So that's more than double the amount of time uh, typically allotted for a 50 item uh, multiple choice examination. So take your time, do not rush. And um, we'll be going, I'll be going over a little bit helpful hints but hint, hint, if you looked at all the stuff that we've been going from week five onwards, a lot of it is identification. So focus a little bit more on identification, a little bit more on the anatomy than the physiology. So with that being said, let's look at also, of course, what's in week 10. If you look at week 10, it's end of course survey. Now, yeah, you could fill it out if you want, but um, like I also mentioned, uh, this is my last uh, term, my last class with Stratford University, as far as I know. Uh, so, um, but never say never. I used to, I used to uh, uh, work for these guys 12 years ago. I left and then uh, they called me back, which is kind of neat. So you never know, um, might come back, but I got to do some traveling. I got to see my daughter. I got to do a whole bunch of stuff. So I never say never, but you know, you could do the end of, I don't really, so, um, but for your other courses, for your other professors, make sure you perform the end of course survey and make sure you put um, uh, constructive criticism. Like uh, don't put stuff like, what do I see sometimes on end of course surveys? Well, uh, um, what was something ridiculous? Like Dr. Garayas didn't give me a lab coat or it was something stupid. And it, and it was not stupid. Well, yeah, it was stupid. But, uh, but, but it's not something constructive to the, the building of the class. And also one question that they're going to ask if, if, because the campus president is privy to all the, you know, the, all the comments, they're going to ask you, did you talk to your professor when this problem came up? And if your answer is no, then it's kind of on you. But here is one of the um, many opportunities for the student to voice their opinion on how to uh, uh, mold um, the, the curriculum. And especially those of you who are going into nursing, 
um, you will, uh, what do you call that? You will have these town meetings. Do not hesitate to go. That is your opportunity to voice your opinion and to have student governance. Student governance, if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, that's when the student has a say on what is being taught to them. And that's really important in health science and in, um, and in uh, nursing as well. And another public service announcement, the nursing letters have been sent. I've been informed officially last night by Dr. Bright, all letters have been sent. So if you didn't get a, if you applied for term one, 2022, and you didn't get a letter over the weekend, you didn't make it, okay? I'm trying to get the list of what happened, why uh, certain people didn't get chosen, uh, but um, I can almost tell you it's T scores and grades. And, but I always, this is what I've been getting back some feedback from some of the students, but I had, I had A's and B's. Well, there was a, there was a whole bunch of people that had all A's. Oh, but I had a, I had a, I passed my T's. Yeah, but you passed it with a 74. I count, there was almost more than a dozen who had scores in the nineties. So remember School of Nursing is now a little bit more competitive and uh, they have to accept the better candidate. Okay, so if you didn't quite make it, take a look at your T scores, take a look at your uh, overall GPA. If your GPA doesn't look like 3.90, then uh, you have the option to some take, retake some classes because the B minus standard, the 3.00 standard, uh, this term was direct evidence that it's not cutting it and it's not gonna make it. And you got, you got to look at it by the numbers. Uh, a person with better grades and better T scores will have a better chance of, be, uh, of passing the NCLEX. And that ultimately is how the School of Nursing gets judged by the Virginia Board of Nursing, by the NCLEX scores. And just to share, right, and to, for full disclosure, NCLEX scores for Stratford University are not good, okay? So uh, it's something that nursing is working very hard on. And uh, a lot of the students, they're, everyone's upping their game. So uh, now that some of you that are still in BS Health Science, um, you know, up your game. Uh, bring, bring, bring your study, bring everything to the next level. Okay, that's number one. And for those of you who are in healthcare admin, health information management, you know, uh, it's not as competitive, but hey, when you graduate, is gonna get highly competitive uh, when you're out there. Um, my wife just reported that Inova uh, Fairfax Services, um, Healthcare Services, which is the, um, it is the financial arm of Inova uh, because you know Inova is a 501c um, uh, non, uh, nonprofit organization, but it does have a financial arm. And those of you who know a little bit about finance, a little bit about well, how a nonprofit works, they also have to make money and they also have to answer to a board, um, uh, a board of directors as well, just like any other company, uh, if not more so. And uh, they're very big into charitable, so they like making, you know, uh, a profit so that they can give back to the community. And that's why Inova is so popular and, and um, you know, to cut down to the chase of it. They have um, uh, 40 per, in my wife's department for healthcare administration, uh, for patient intake, there's a 40% turnover. Meaning to say is four out of 10 applicants uh, usually get um, fired due to a non-performance. So even if you're a healthcare admin, health information management, medical billing and coding, up your game, get used to the higher level. Um, because out there, when we make a mistake, people either get hurt or die. And we're not in that business. And none of us are. We're in the business to make things better. All right. So that's my last soapbox for this class. So next week, no Zoom, just go into announcements, do your exam, get it done by 10, 15 a.m. If you have any issues, um, I'll be monitoring uh, both my email and my phone uh, that morning, uh, um, all morning. And um, I even get a call out for people who don't take the exam. So um, please, 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 if like, you know, some emergency comes up, please communicate it uh, as soon as possible. So what are we doing this week? I'm sorry, Professor, question. Yep. Sure, shoot. Um, are you going to help um, give us the review, like the review questions? Like yeah, I'll be, I'll, yeah, thank you for reminding me. Um, just like the midterm, I'll be posting, um, what do you call that? Uh, I'm trying to do two things at once. I'll be posting... Um, 
uh, an exam that I gave uh, like last year uh, as an example for what to look at. And again, uh, just like the midterm, I'm not gonna put a key that's for you to figure out, uh, but it'll give you an idea of the scope of how the exam is gonna go down on which, uh, which uh, topics were important. And like I stated earlier, it's going to have more, more of an identification feel than, um, uh, than a physiology feel. But, you know, you have to study both. But you'll, you'll see when you look at the exam. Uh, and it's going to be the same uh, format, 50 items, multiple choice. So acid-base balance. We talked a little bit about that before, but we're going to get into it a little bit more. Uh, now, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, this course isn't pretty isn't designed to talk about uh, disorders, but we're going to talk about um, what go what happens when things go a little bit wrong with acid base. Okay, so we're going to talk about pH, we're going to talk about when things go wrong, like acidosis and alkalosis, and how our acid base balance buffering and um, how our lungs and we already uh, saw that uh, when we went over respiratory, how our lungs also compensate for it. So it's a relatively short lecture, but this is a very important thing because uh, um, uh, pH or the measurement of the hydrogen ion in your, uh, in your body can totally ruin, easily put you in a coma, easily put you, uh, easily get you dead. So let's look at, Chapter 26 in our open sacs. Table of contents, so many things to click on. 21, 25, 26. Okay. So we already know that there's like around two thirds uh, of your body is water, okay? So that balance of that water or the things in, uh, in, um, in that water is kind of important to us. And if you look at your typical human being, look how much water is in a lot of things, okay? And a study came out, I don't think it was like 10, 15 years ago, uh, where uh, they stated that, um, you know, Americans in general were dehydrated in general. And uh, that's why, especially in the gym, you see a lot of people walking around with these big jugs of water, because especially when you're working out, of course, you sweat and uh, you're going through metabolic processes that require water. Okay. So... Uh, da, 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 da. Let's get to intracellular, extracellular. That's not so funny. We want to get into how things go in and out of your cells. Now, we already know that this is the um, uh, biphospholipid layer, also known as the gatekeeper of our cells and um, the, um, the uh, plasma membrane of our cells. You know, that skin that goes around all cells. And you will see here that electrolytes such as sodium, right, and chlorine and potassium, they go in and out. And we already know that sodium is kind of, well, is kind of like uh, the, the start button for most of our cellular processes. And potassium is kind of like the uh, reset button or the off button for a lot of processes. We already kind of mentioned that when we were talking about EKG, we were talking about the heart, that sodium jump starts the action potential or the electricity that will make my heart pump or contract. And then potassium is the repolar signals, the repolarization or resetting of it. And we need an aqueous environment or a fluid environment, right? Water, so that things can go in and out. Now, things are, can go in and out through these channels. And you can see these channels have doors and they open and close. And if I'm going against a gradient, right? For example, I'm pumping out sodium 
from a low concentration, you can see these little orange hexagons of sodium. So if I'm going from a low concentration to a high concentration, guess what? I'm going to need energy, okay, in the form of ATP. And again, ATP, I require oxygen. I require glucose to make this ATP so that this process can, can move forward, right? You could also see potassium also working against the gradient of low concentration out here and high concentration in here. And when it's time for the cell to go do work, the ATP pump pumps sodium against gradient. When it's time for potassium to do work, the sodium goes uh, the potassium uh, pump then pumps it what? Out. And you could see the sodium and potassium, they get exchanged. Hence the term sodium potassium ATPase pump, which is this thing right here. Okay, now part of that whole equation is also water because how does this stuff float in and out of here? Well, and how does uh, diffusion work? Remember, diffusion works from uh, a high concentration gradient to a low concentration gradient. And if we're going the opposite direction, we need a pump or we need energy to do so. So that's also another reason why we need water, okay? Uh, so that things in our body can move around. OK, that's why our blood has a, diff, a decent amount of water in it. So it can be pumped and can be moved around because we need our blood to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, the pressure at which water, hydro, and whatever's inside it exerts on itself, then that's how things move in and out. So if I have a, a, a positive pressure here on this side, it's gonna push it what? This way, such as filtration in my kidneys. Now, if I have a negative pressure right here and a positive pressure out here, then it's gonna promote reabsorption. And when I'm in equilibrium, when there's no pressure, then nothing goes in and out. So know that from a high to a low concentration, filtration. And the, uh, the exact opposite is reabsorption. And we already learned that in the kidneys when we talked about the glomerulus okay, and how it filters. Ugh, why, why does it do that? Okay. So, not only water is important, but the salts, sodium, potassium, chlorine, chlorine is just as important, okay? And the term osmolality is the ratio between these solutes, which are the salts, and the solution, which is, which is water. That's why we're very, very cognizant in healthcare regarding dehydration, especially for the very, very old and the very, very young. And we're also uh, cognizant about how water, and we already talked about this when we talked about kidneys, messes with your blood pressure as well. That's why you have a low salt diet. Because if you eat, if you're like me and eat a whole bunch of Doritos, right? What's gonna happen? All, wherever salt goes, water is gonna follow. So the salt's in my body, water is gonna stay in my body. And then what's gonna happen? I got more water in my system. My blood pressure will increase. OK, so we kind of discussed that when we talked about the renin algae and angiotensin aldosterone system and the regulation of uh, water output, of course, is, of course, antidiuretic hormone, all the hormones that we mentioned in um, the renal chapter. But antidiuretic hormone, use your medical terminology powers. Anti means against, diuresis means to void or to um, urinate. So antidiuretic hormone means I'm going to keep the water. I'm not going to urinate. I'm going to antidiurese myself. It's also known as vasopressin because if I have more fluid in my system, what's going to happen to my blood pressure? Vaso, which is my blood vessels, it is going to be press or pressure. So, and we can use things like ADH and similar medication if I want to bring up your blood pressure. We use things to block. Uh, or like a, like a diuretic, like a water pill to let the water out. 
we kind of already discussed this. So I'm going to keep on going because I want to get to the crux of the matter, which is pH. And here's the major players. Sodium, potassium, chlorine, calcium, 2 plus, phosphate, HPO2, I mean, HPO4, 2 minus, and bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, okay? Uh, in the future, you're going to have to memorize these, but for now, no. Now just know, like, what are the chemical signals, symbols, and what they do. And we already talked about sodium. We already talked about potassium. And today, we're going to be talking about bicarb. And remember, too much or too little of any of this stuff, like uh, too much sodium, you have hypernatremia. Too little sodium, you have hyponatremia. Too little potassium, you have hypokalemia. Too much potassium, hyperkalemia. Either way, we already know that potassium or the balance of potassium shuts things down in my heart. Remember, we, I mentioned um, in the cardiac lecture that potassium iodide is one of the chemicals that we use in a lethal injection, right? We, we shut down that person's heart, right, on purpose. Chloride as well. Bicarbonate, again, and if we look at your typical uh, uh, bicarbonate um, reaction here, carbon dioxide plus water, right? Carbonic acid, which will give me bicarbonate and H plus. That's right there. So you need to breathe, exhale. You need to have water in your system as well. Phosphates, we already talked about um, its uh, utilization in um, uh, calcium. So calcium, phosphate, magnesium, phos, and all that, those are really important with uh, regarding bones, bone structure. It's also a buffer too, and we're going to talk about what a buffer is. So we already went through this, regulation of that, and then let's get to acid base. Oh, here we go. So you have a chart that looks like this. Let's, I like this chart. Let me, um, let me see if I have acid base in my uh, Stratford University. Uh, you can practice it. Uh, no, I don't. So I'll make one. Let's, let's look. Let's look it up. So let's look at this pH scale. Take this, copy image. And voila. Okay, wonderful. So let's look at this. So our body, if you look at pure water, um, physiologic pH is around 7.4, give or take. This is where your body likes to be. It likes to be in the middle. Now, what exactly does pH mean? pH actually means the negative log, a logarithm, if any of you remember your algebra, of the concentration of the hydrogen ion. What does that mean? Well, when the number is down to closer to one, that means things that are uh, down here are highly acidic. They're an acid. So if I tell you uh, my patient has a pH of four, that means you'll know that what? It's not, my patient should be neutral, should be here. Right, let me put a happy face right here. This is where my patient should be. 
somewhere here, 7.4 in the middle. But if their pH starts moving here, that means they're acidic. That means there is too much or is an increase of the hydrogen ion in their body. That's not a good thing. Remember, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. So you see here, if it's just mildly acidic like milk, okay, I pour milk in your eye or a banana, it's not too irritable, right? But if I start pouring stuff like lemon juice, right, and vinegar in your eye, which is now more acidic, this is going to start to hurt, isn't it? And the stomach acid, which is pH 1, which is actually hydrochloric acid, which is this stuff here. I'm going to write HCl here for hydrochloric acid. If I took the hydrochloric acid out of your stomach and put it on top of the hood of your car, it would eat away at the paint of the hood of your car and into the metal. That's how reactive it is. And that's how we know, remember uh, the lecture about ions? Ions here, H plus, that means I have uh, one less electron. These substances here are highly reactive. Yeah, put lemon juice on your car in the hot sun. See how that works for you. Or vinegar. Put that on your car. See what it does to the paint. Because it's highly reactive, okay? So the closer you get to this one on a pH scale, it means you have more acid. So banana is less acidic than a tomato. Tomatoes at pH four, bananas at pH five. Both of them are what? Slightly acidic. But then when you get closer to here, to pH one, like a lemon or hydrochloric acid, it's highly acidic. So that's that side of the pH scale. The other side, the closer you move to the other side, you have an increase of hydrogen ion, O, H, minus. That means the closer you get to the pH of 14, this is highly basic, or it's a base also known as alkaline. You know, like the batteries, when you have alkaline one battery. I'm using my finger and my mouth, so I'm trying to be as neat as possible. So if you have something like baking soda, which is mildly basic, it's all right. And then you have soap, a little bit more basic. Bleach, very extremely basic. Drano or drain cleaner. And of course, you got sodium hydroxide, which is very, very alkaline, very basic. So this is also equally reactive. Put drain cleaner on the hood of your car. See what that does. Put drain cleaner in your face or drink it. See what that does. No, scratch that. Please don't do that. I had a uh, patient. I was an EMS. Um, she tried to kill herself. She took a whole bunch of Drano and drank it. Here's the horrific part. It burned her throat, her mouth, her teeth on the way down. Then she vomited it and burned it all back up on the way back up. She had to have facial reconstructive surgery and also reconstructive three or four surgeries on her throat, pharynx, larynx. I don't think she was able to talk anymore after that. All because of, I don't know, some dude. No dude, no, no, no relationship is worth that. I never understood that. So that's basic. So these things on the, the scale, 12, 13, 14, highly reactive. Do not mix bleach and Drano, bleach and Clorox. Do not do that. Having your nice, uh, nice uh, chemical bomb in there. And when that gets into your lungs, that's a hydroxide. It's a base. It's highly alkaline, highly reactive to your lungs. And it will burn your lungs because this is also very reactive here 
on the pH scale. Now, here's the neat part. If you're into like Illuminati stuff, we are made out of what? Two thirds of water. And that means we're in the middle. What happens if I put an H plus and an OH minus together? Guess what I have? I have H. You know what? Let me have a different color here. Or is it? Can I get a different color? No. I'll just use this. What's this? Mm. Oh, okay. So what do I get? If I put H plus and OH minus together, I get H. Two. Oh. Isn't that water? Isn't that neat? How that all makes sense? How everything should be in balance? How our whole body should be in balance? And that's why we do IV therapy and things like that. Now, one of the metabolic, um, there are two compensations. One is metabolic. And the other one is um, uh, respiratory. We already kind of learned respiratory when we talked about the lung and we talked about arterial blood gas, right? But uh, we'll review that. But let's talk about the uh, metabolic ones first. And um, I'll have this available for you guys as well. So to recap, the pH scale simply means the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion. When in chemistry, when you have these brackets like that, it means concentration. If the number is closer to one on a pH scale from one to 14, that means, the, that, means um, uh, that substance is acidic. If from eight to 14, that means the substance is base, basic or alkaline. Um, and you put it all together, OH minus and H plus, right? Which was, means your uh, patient's in balance. It should yield water which is around seven point, uh, pH of 7.4, also known as physiologic pH. It's, I think it's 7.35 to 7.45 uh, range, which is around 7.4. And that's H2O, water, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And that's water. And that's pretty neat. Now, let's talk about buffers. Now, what's a buffer? A buffer is either a weak acid or a weak base that will, um, you know, help me stay in balance. So for example, let's say uh, my patient's a little bit on the acidic side. It's like maybe they have 5.96. So they're here. Remember, 7.4 is normal, but now they're a little bit on the acidic side. We already know that. So what will I, what will happen? Your body will release a buffer. And a buffer is either a weak acid or a weak base that'll help move things, nudge things towards the middle here. So let's say I'm here, right? Everyone see here, I'm like at five, nine, six almost, right? My body will release, since I'm acidic, it will release sodium bicarbonate or sodium bicarb. And we already know that bicarb is a base, HCO, HCO3 minus, right? Minus, it's a base. So what's it going to do? It's going to nudge that 5.9 closer and closer and closer to 7.4 so that I can be in homeostasis. I can be in the middle. Let's say, for example, I'm a little bit um, basic. I'm more close to eight or nine. Another term is alkaline. My patient's blood is what? Eight and nine. Not a good thing, right? I mean, it's closer to nine. It could be eight. It'll be all right. But when it's closer to like nine, that's not a good thing because I need to be in balance. So what is my body going to release? It's going to release a, um, a, a, a mild acid. And an example is um, uh, lactic acid, right? We get that from when we work out. When you get crampy, when you work out, um, that's, uh, that's uh, lactic acid that's doing that to you. So the lactic acid then will bring that pH 9, nudge it to 8.9, 8.7, 8.6, 5, all the way back down to around 7.4. So those lactic acid is a mild acid. 
Bicarbonate is a mild base. Both of them act as buffers when released by the body to keep you in check and keep you in the middle, keep you in homeostasis, which is physiologic pH 7.4. Or let's say you're sick, right? Your body isn't doing that for you. What can we put in, um, what can we put in your IV? You guys see it on TV or maybe you are at work. Then it gives, then you will now fully understand why did the doctor order sodium bicarb push? Because my patient's slightly acidic. I got to get them back in the middle. Or why did we order ringer's lactate? Lactate is the chemical term for lactic acid. Okay. So now you can see how medical management, we're just mimicking uh, what actually normally happens in your body, but sometimes we have to exaggerate it, especially when my patient's sick or when my patient's compensatory systems aren't working. Now, the next compensatory system is your pulmonary. And we kind of know this from exercise physiology. So let's look, see my pointer here. So let's say, for example, I'm working out, right? I'm walking on the treadmill, then I started jogging. My pH is going to go from 7.4 and it's going to start to move acidic. And why? I just mentioned that when you move your muscles and you do a lot of metabolic stuff, you know, you're, you're, you're burning fuel, you're, you're moving your muscles. Um, you guys know when, like, uh, when you go to the gym and maybe you haven't been to a gym for a while and you're on that treadmill or you're on that elliptical machine or you're lifting weights, you feel that, you know, it's crampy and it starts to hurt a little, like there's a little burn in your muscles. Well, that burn is from lactic acid and lactic acid buildup. Now, when you have a buildup of lactic acid and you're maybe you're, you're huffing and you're puffing, right? you start becoming acidic. Now, I just mentioned, when you start working out and you start um, um, straining yourself, you're gonna start to breathe. Now, why? Your breathing will get faster because of course, what? You're moving your muscles. So you're gonna, about, your respiratory rate will get faster. Now, why does it get faster? It gets faster because your body is detecting an increase of CO2 buildup in your uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And that means I have to now do what? <laughs> Get rid of that CO2. Because guess what's associated with CO2? Hydrogen ion, right? So when I'm breathing, <laughs> exhaling, I'm exhaling CO2 and along with it, hydrogen ion. So let's say I'm here, I'm crampy, it's been 10 minutes on the treadmill. I'm sweating. I'm having a hard time. So what does my body start doing? <laughs> right? It starts throwing out carbon dioxide and along with it, hydrogen ion in my breath. <laughs> and then it's going to push my body towards where? Back to normal so I can keep on jogging and keep on running. And that's why um, not only form is really, really important in running, um, I once took a, um, a breathing seminar more than, oh, more than 20 years ago to improve my running and my run times. And um, there are breathing techniques. Did you ever wonder how like athletes and also, um, you know, marathoners, how they can run so long and so far, not only their form of running is highly efficient, it's also the, the way they breathe. And they, the way they, uh, they breathe and recover and get rid of that hydrogen ion and uh, along with it, that excess carbon dioxide. So that is a pulmonary compensatory mechanism. Now, what happens if I'm very basic or alkaline? What's my body going to do? It's going to breathe less. It's going to slow down its breathing to do what? to retain more acid, and then it will slowly retain the acid and slowly come back to what? 7.4. So know that there is a metabolic compensation, most likely renal, right? Remember the chemicals, lactic acid and bicarbonate. 
And then there's also, of course, a breathing or pulmonary mechanism of compensation, which is, of course, rapid breathing if I become acidic or shallow breathing if I become basic or and or alkaline. And I'll save this so you guys can, you know, follow along at home when you're watching the video again. And that's called MED 110 and uh, pH uh, charts. So let's close this. And that's essentially your pH in a nutshell. Oh, hemoglobin, also a buffer, because of course, remember, hydrogen ion is affiliated with CO2. Hemoglobin, which is your blood protein in the middle of your um, uh, red blood cell, carries carbon dioxide and oxygen. And along with carbon dioxide, it can also carry um, hydrogen ion. So when I breathe out, I'm not only throwing out carbon dioxide, I'm also throwing out um, hydrogen ion, which will now make my pH closer to the middle. Phosphate buffer, sodium dihydrogen phosphate, right, again, it's a weak acid and it can do the same thing as lactic acid, okay? Remember, a buffer is either a weak acid or a weak base. We already went over bicarbonate. Carbonic acid is the other side of the equation, okay? Respiratory regulation, here's another one, here's a nice one. If my pH goes down, what do I have? I have acidosis. So what do I have to do? Stimulates brain and arterial receptors. What my body has to do is increase its respiratory rate to decrease its uh, carbon dioxide. Hey, isn't this neat? Doesn't this look like your concept map? And it's a better way to look at things in a pattern, in a path. So you can sit here and memorize it or understand it. I drop my pH, I'm acidic. If I'm acidic, I'll breathe more. If I breathe more, respiratory rate. If that happens, I'm throwing out carbon dioxide. So what's eventually gonna happen? My pH is gonna go up and then it's gonna balance. Let's, let's look at the opposite side of that coin, right? My pH is increased, that means I'm alkalotic. My pH is greater than seven, that's not good. What's it gonna do? My respiratory rate will go down. Why? Because I need to bring up my CO2, bring up, bring up my carbonic acid, which is right here, and then what will it do to the pH? It'll drop the pH back to, back to whatever um, alkaline, back to normal, which is around 7.4. So this is a nice chart. It's a visual representation of how, what I said. So you can play it back and um, understand it. Renal, we already talked about, right? We talked about bicarbonate. There's a um, enzyme. Carbonic anhydrase, very important for that, for, uh, for that bicarbonate to be released from your kidneys. Now, you could sit and memorize for your future uh, pathology, because this is how pathology is. There's symptoms, signs, symptoms, and know the difference between symptoms and the sign. A sign is an actual a uh, thing that can be observed and counted. For example, um, a headache, how do you know what pain is? How do you know what sleepiness is, right? But a sign is stuff like shortness of breath, coughing, or uh, a, a dysrhythmia, increased heart rate. So this is kind of a misnomer. A sign is something that we all see, like a stop sign. I see it, you see it, we all see it. But stuff like headache and sleepiness, how can you grade that? Um, but definitely you'll see LOC, loss of consciousness. Confusion can also be measured by um, your mini mental status exam when we ask the patient things like, hey, what year is it? Uh, what's my name? What's your name? What's your wife's middle name? Stuff like that. And if they can't answer basic, basic questions, that's a problem. And you could see metabolic issues anytime I have disease, 
or even strenuous exercise, it's going to mess with my um, it's going to mess with my acid base balance. It's also the reason why people don't um, uh, take aspirin anymore. Uh, they call it SSA, ASA, um, but uh, aspirin is is quite acidic. And then you add that to your stomach acid, it, it's not fun. So a lot of people just use NSAIDs or non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatory drugs like Tylenol or ibuprofen. Uh, metabolic, yeah, we already meant to uh, compensation. We already went through that. I think we're done. Let's check just to be sure. Yep, we're done. It's already at the key terms in the back. So let's go look over. Now, uh, since it's uh, uh, the last week, don't do discussion nine. Don't do lesson nine. Just do a task. If you did nine, lesson nine, I'll give you extra credit, but uh, focus on your final exam. Focus on your final exams. Just do the task. I repeat, just do the task for next week. Everything, uh, heck, do it today. Do it now, right? Get it over with so you can start, uh, start studying. All right, so no discussions, no lesson. Uh, give you guys a break uh, so that you can focus on your final exam. The next thing, let's look at that practice exam. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Um, this is what I meant to do. Okay. Oh, it's practice midterm. It even says practice midterm, silly me. Let me find practice final. Uh, week nine. Let me do. Yep, I don't have it here. But let's go over. There's. A, I could still go over it. So when you're looking at stuff that, what am I going to study? How am I going to study? And remember, it's uh week five items onward. So if I'm looking at this, cellular genetics, right? And that's the digestive system. And I'm looking at this structure of digestive system, physical and chemical digestion and metabolic reactions. Don't you think that if I'm going to grab, if I'm making, if my exam has five chapters, right? Five, six chapters. And then I got 50 items. There's going to be anywhere from like what? Nine to 10 questions per chapter, right? To, to even everything out. So don't you think I can go right into, um, uh, like the chapter 23 in your textbook and do this. Twenty three. Hey, you see that there's a chapter review in the back, right? And there's also a review questions. So when I'm looking at these review questions, right? Which of these organs is not considered an accessory organ? Okay. When you're looking at a multiple choice question, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what do they want? So in this particular question, what do they want? Goes, not accessory. So what's another way of looking at not accessory? I got to look at something that's main. So I have to ask myself, oral cavity, right? Salivary glands, pancreas, liver. I know for a fact that the pancreas 
is not part of, is an accessory organ, because we discussed that at the end of the chapter. So I'm gonna cross that out. Wait, well, let me, here's a better way of doing it. Uh, I'll shift four. Take this. Where is it? There it is. Okay. So let's look at this. So when I'm looking at a question, the first thing I have to do is what does the question want? So which of these organs is not an accessory organ? Not considered. So not accessory, digestive. So when I'm looking at this, Remember we had an upper respiratory tract and a lower respiratory tract. Did we mention the mouth as part of upper or lower respiratory tract? Yep, we did. Did we mention salivary gland as part of the upper respiratory and lower respiratory tract? Eh, maybe. The pancreas, did we mention it as a distinct part of the upper respiratory and lower respiratory tract? Nah, not really, because we've talked about that at the end, right? So I'm going to cross that out. Liver, definitely an accessory organ. It's not part of the tubing of the upper and uh, uh, lower, um, uh, not respiratory tract, um, uh, gastrointestinal tract or GI, GI tract. So that's out. So what am I doing here? I'm doing process of elimination. And in process of elimination, there's one I like, and the one there's kind of I like. So... I have to ask myself, which one is not an accessory, an accessory organ, right? So another way of saying not an accessory organ, what am I really looking for? I'm looking for what? A main organ. Out of these two, which one's main? Which one's more central to you living? Your mouth, your whole entire mouth, or one of your salivary glands? And the answer is it's your mouth. So that's how you do a um, uh, process of elimination. Now, you're not done. Before you move on to the next question, you have to ask yourself, okay, mouth. Is mouth a not accessory organ? Is mouth a main Yes, it is. If it's yes, what do I do? I move on with my day. Do I think about it anymore? Nope. And that's it. Try not to skip because it messes, it, it, it messes things up. You don't skip patients. Why are you skipping questions? And there's always one. I'm telling you, there was two actually last midterm. There's always one person who messes up the, uh, the numbering order. And then uh, lucky if I catch it, but if I don't catch it, it's what? It's just all wrong. Everything after that is wrong. So pay attention, focus on one question at a time and follow this protocol when, uh, when you're looking at things. Now let's go back to when we were looking at, looking at stuff. Which of the following organs is supported by a layer of adventitia or layer serosa? Did we really talk about that? No, right? Which of the following membranes covers the stomach? We might have mentioned it. We did actually, right? So this is part, but eh, it's a little bit more specific. Which of these processes occurs in the mouth? Well, we did go through these things, right? This is more of a physiology question. Which of the processes occurs throughout the uh, most of the layer, right? Uh, we didn't do this, but didn't we mention absorption, right? And where things get absorbed? That's a better question. That's, uh, that's a small intestine versus a large intestine. And, right, let's look at, you see how this is all words, words, words? And I told you already, I like identification. So, Don't you think I could take this or something that looks like this? 
GI anatomy quiz. Do you think I could do something like this? A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Yeah, I could. I most probably would. Or even better, this one. It's nicer. It's prettier. And instead of this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And on each one, there was, there was a specific thing that we talked about. So that could, could that be a side question? Like, so out of these, uh, which one has a pH of uh, one to get rid of all bacteria and also to break down proteins? Stomach. Which uh, uh, releases glucagon and um, insulin? Pancreas. Then I could ask you a question. Glucagon versus insulin. Which one gets released when I eat a big meal? Which one gets released when I'm starving? What chemical that gets released when um, I have a starvation state greater, greater than uh, 14 hours? That's a pancreas question. I just asked you the small intestine versus large intestine. Which one makes feces? Which one has your appendix? Which one is directly connected to your stomach, right? Your duodenum. What are the three parts of your small intestine? Duodenum, ileum, jejunum. Which one's first? Duodenum. What's the function of the gallbladder? Where is it located? It's located in the inferior surface of your liver. What's its function? It's an emulsifier. It breaks down fat. Remember the story that I told you about my student who can no longer eat Doritos because she's got no gallbladder. They removed it. So she has to be on a very low uh, fat to no fat diet because she has nothing to emulsify the fat. And of course, liver, we also mentioned is not only a detoxifier, which we already know that it detoxifies um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, things like alcohol, but it also is, it is the largest metabolic accessory organ in your body. And you could see how the gallbladder, liver, and pancreas, they're accessory organs. You could see the salivary gland, accessory organs. Who's the main stars? You have your oropharynx, your pharynx, laryngopharynx, your esophagus, which is your food tube, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and it ends in here in the final uh, tube, uh, your rectum. So that's how to look at your exams. That's how to look at preparing for exams. Ask yourself, what's a good thing to ask? And how's this? Can you make your own quiz? Sure. Take a piece of paper, right? Um, either print this out and then write all this stuff out and then take it like it's a quiz and do that with every single chapter. So you have seven days. Imagine you go through every chapter every day. I mean, one chapter a day for the next five days. And then, uh, then you have an extra day to do what? Put it all together. You could easily figure out my final exam just by knowing on how um, um, uh, I, I take tests. Ooh, look at this. You have a chart like this. What does gastrin do? Right. And then you put, you know, um, remember I said hormone and action. Very, very, uh, very, very need to know. Okay. So when, when you'll see when I post it and I'll, and I'll post, um, uh, the practice exam, like right after, uh, we end this, um, um, what do you call that? Uh, this session, but that's essentially how it goes. Uh, let's do one more chapter just to make sure that you guys get what I'm, get what I'm saying. So that was five. Let's, let's random and do six. And it's based on the objective. So I'm looking at six. What's the objective for six? Circulatory system, structure of function of the heart, arteries and capillaries. Oh, that's easy. Right, uh, where's heart? Uh, blood flow, blood pressure, anatomy, lymphatic systems, here. Heart's easy because it's staring you in the face. This yeah, is nice, right? But remember we spent some time on this. That's good. Don't you think I could do that? Layers? Don't you think this will easily come out? This will easily come out? How about conduction system of the heart? Inner uh, structure of the heart? Don't you think that'll come out? That's easy. 
I mean, not necessarily easy, but easy to know that that's got to come out. We didn't talk about that diagram. We didn't talk about that diagram. But heavens to mercy, if we didn't talk about this, nice to know. We did talk about that. But the other two pictures above it uh, that we previously showed, that's really important. Uh, but uh, this. Remember I had a video? And it talked about this picture. There's a nice picture. It's in green. There's a nice one. And it's somewhere in your textbook as well. Do you think I could erase all this? Where's your essay node? Oh, it's here. AV node here. Which one's the pacemaker? This one. Which one are the brakes? This one. Then you have your bundle of his left and right bundle branches, and then you have your Purkinje fibers. Where is it located? Well, your bundle branches and your bundle of his is what? In the interventricular septum. Where's the rest of it? Um, your Purkinje fibers are located in the lateral walls of your ventricles. Where's your SA node located? A right atrium. Where's your AV node located? Right atrium. Doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? So when you start looking at all the diagrams and uh, start re-watching the videos, Things that I say, things that I goes, uh, things that have been mentioned, it starts coming out and it starts making sense. And it was, uh, the only the only person who's the only person to blame that you didn't ace my exam is you, right? You either didn't pay attention before, didn't pay attention after, and pay attention during. So um, um, you look at each and every one of those questions that are in. Um, the practice exam, you'll see that I've either mentioned it or showed a picture of it somewhere. So with that being stated, we lost a couple of you or one of you. That's all right. I got you uh, for attendance. Um, it is this point of the show, of course. I will uh, stop the recording and I'll make it available.